Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AIS Academy. Today is day 5 and the last day of Shankar AIS Academy's free mainstorming scholarship test or free main scholarship test. The question for today has been given in the last part of the analysis in this video. These are the list of articles taken for analysis from today's newspaper. It has been given along with the page numbers from the different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description box and also in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. This news article states that China has conducted high intensity naval exercises in South China Sea. It has worried its Asian neighbors and also United States of America. We also have a stake in this matter. So in this context, we'll discuss about South China Sea, the countries involved in this area. Then we'll also see China's expansionism there and why India has to look into these developments. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. First, let's understand this geography of South China Sea. See, it is located in Western Pacific Ocean. Have a look at this map. From this, you can understand that many players are here. For example, the main stakeholders are China, Taiwan or Chinese Taipei, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, Singapore and Indonesia. Of course, as we know, of them, the most aggressive is China that has even started island building and island development and also naval patrolling in the disputed region. This is why countries such as United States, Australia, they accuse China of militarizing the South China Sea. And as per official reports of United States government, between December 2013 and October 2015, China has built artificial islands with a total area of close to 3,000 acres on seven coral reefs that it occupies in the Spratly Islands in southern part of South China Sea. And if you come to the present scenario, the scale and speed of China in these activities is increasing. Now coming to dispute in South China Sea, it refers to territorial dispute over the sovereignty of waters in South China Sea, which includes numerous shoals, reefs, atolls and islands. Some of the important islands, Spratly Islands, Paracel Islands, Natuna Islands, which is located in southern part of South China Sea. The dispute also involves energy-rich Scarborough Shoal. Now, if China occupies this Scarborough Shoal, it will provide China a better surveillance of United States and Philippine forces. And China also can intimidate by deploying missiles if it occupies this entire area of Scarborough Shoal. Among all the stakeholders, China claims the largest territory which it marks by nine red dotted lines as you can see in this map called as nine dash line. The line covers almost entire South China Sea. Going by this line, we can understand how China violates the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea and how China follows aggressive expansionist policy. Know that China claims indisputable sovereignty over the areas inside the Nine Dash Line. Now, why the region is heavily disputed? What is the significance of this region? See, there are reports of large-scale untapped oil and natural gas reserves in this region. So accessibility to the resource will ensure energy security which is crucial for development of a particular country. And South China Sea is one of major shipping routes. Around 30% of world trade pass through this area. And it is in the route between the ports in Indian Ocean, then energy rich Middle East countries and the Asian countries. So you can go through this map to know how energy flows through the South China Sea. So it is clear that this region, it plays a crucial point for energy flowing from Persian Gulf and Africa to countries such as China, South Korea, Japan, Malaysia, etc. We already mentioned about the nine dash line. In this regard, know that Philippines has a dispute with China over Spratly Islands and it invoked the dispute settlement mechanism of UNCLOS in the year 2013. The matter was taken to permanent court of arbitration and permanent court of arbitration stated that the nine dash line has no legal basis but China called this order null and void. And this is how China respects international rule based order and international institutions. So for more information on China Philippines dispute, we request the viewers to watch the relevant article analysis on 8 July 2020. So now to conclude this discussion, we can say that recent high intensity naval exercise by Beijing 
is further intensifying tensions in the region and China should abide by the orders of permanent court of arbitration and stop involving in building artificial islands with military installations in the South China Sea. Now, there are two important reasons why India has to worry over the development in the region because Andaman and Nicobar Islands region is not far away from South China Sea and the entire trade route which is now available and which was available to be specific is necessary for India for carrying out trade and other relations with various countries in the region and beyond. If China occupies the region, the freedom of navigation will be affected not only for India, for all other countries as well. So countries have to find a way to put an end to arbitrary actions of China with zero concerns for international systems and the countries which are stakeholders in the region. With this we come to the end of analysis of this news article. Now let's move on to next article. This news article talks about a bill that is being enacted by the US National Legislature, the US Congress. The bill seeks to expand India-US cooperation in education sector and also in terms of cultural ties. We'll discuss important provisions of this bill and we will see how it seeks to cement the academic and cultural cooperation and also at some levels the people-to-people -people contact between India and United States of America. The syllabus relevant for the analysis is highlighted here for your reference. See, this bill is called as Gandhi King Scholarly Exchange Initiative Bill. It aims to establish a bilateral partnership for collaboration to advance development and shared values. In this regard, the bill will create an exchange program between India and the United States to study the work and legacies of Magatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. And we know that Martin Luther King Jr. was a human rights crusader and also a fighter against discrimination. Gandhi is followed across the globe for his vision, which is guiding Indian foreign policy in the light of framing development partnerships. Gandhi once said, I do want to think in terms of whole world. My patriotism includes the good of mankind in general. Therefore, my service to India includes the service of humanity. So once the bill comes into force, it will be known as Gandhi King Scholarly Exchange Initiative Act. So one of the important provisions is to create a professional exchange program to be called as Gandhi King Scholarly Exchange Initiative. In this initiative, there will be an annual education forum for scholars from both the countries and this forum will meet or convene alternatively in United States and in India. The forum will focus on social justice, human rights and civil rights. It will also focus on non-violence, democracy, refugee crisis. It will include representatives from various fields like from the side of government, from the side of non-governmental organizations, civil society, educational organizations, cultural groups, women's rights groups. Members will also include religious and ethnic minorities and marginalized communities as well. And this exchange initiative also seeks to create an undergraduate and postgraduate student exchange program between the two countries. This program will focus on the study of history and legacies of the two leaders. And under this program, there will be visits to historic sites in India and United States. Here when we say historic sites, it refers to sites which are integral to the American civil rights movement and also sites which are important for Indian independence movement. And this program supports research and development of papers on the importance of peace, non-violence and reconciliation or peaceful dispute resolution in current conflict regions. Then this act will create a Gandhi King Global Academy. Now this academy will be a professional development training initiative on conflict resolution tools which are to be based on principles of non-violence for which two leaders are known for. It will have a focus on the success of non-violent movements, inclusion and representation in conflict resolution. Now, another important provision of the bill is to establish the US-India Gandhi King Development Foundation. Now, this foundation will be set up by US Agency for International Development, shortly called as USAID and the Government of India. As of now, it is reported that this foundation is to be organized under the Indian law and not under the US laws. And the mandate of this foundation is to provide grants to non-governmental organizations that work in India, particularly in the matters related to health, pollution and climate change, education and empowerment of women. For this purpose, both the governments will convene a governing council to provide guidance and direction to this foundation. 
The majority of the members of this governing council will be appointed by the United States for a term of five years. This council will identify development priorities and it will also define criteria for awarding grants by the foundation. The foundation will have a proposed budget of up to 30 million for one financial year from 2020 through 2025. So these are some of the important aspects of this developing Gandhi King's Scholarly Exchange Initiative Bill. We saw few institutional arrangements of cooperation that the bill aims to establish to enrich the existing India-US relations in academic and cultural cooperation. Now let's move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article talks about a collaboration between the state government of Andhra Pradesh and Amazon Web Services. They may become partners for skilling and promotion of entrepreneurship and in digital governance of the state. Know that, as we know, Amazon is an American multinational technology company that focuses on e-commerce, cloud computing, artificial intelligence and several other areas as well. We in India mainly consider Amazon as an e-commerce company but know that the United States government has a partnership with Amazon in an important program called as Fairness in Artificial Intelligence. This initiative is expected to have direct impact on new artificial intelligence applications from driverless vehicles to banking algorithms. Now coming to Amazon Web Services. See, it is a subsidiary of Amazon. This offers cloud computing services. The article also states that Andhra Pradesh government is already collaborating with Amazon for the empowerment of women entrepreneurs under a program called as Amazon Saheli. In this context, let us see in brief about this program. See, it is an initiative of Amazon. The purpose is to popularize locally made products from women entrepreneurs in India. It aims to enable women to become successful sellers on Amazon. The word Saheli in Hindi means a female friend. So here Amazon is acting like a friend to women by enabling them to become successful online entrepreneurs. Now let's see few benefits of joining this Amazon Saheli program. One is that the beneficiaries will be given subsidized referral fee. When we say referral fee, it is a fee that Amazon charges from a seller. Every time she sells a product, Amazon gives relaxation to women entrepreneurs in this regard under this program. The next benefit is personalized training for a quick start in Amazon. This training will help the newcomer to know how to sell on Amazon to kickstart the business. The Amazon account manager is to guide the woman entrepreneur for first 30 days in respect of managing accounts, other things related to selling online. Then Amazon will also provide imaging or professional product photo shoot and also cataloging support. Here cataloging we are referring to the process of listing sellers products, displaying the quantity, type, specifications, descriptions of products etc. Then another important benefit is increased customer visibility. The products from women entrepreneurs will be displayed in the Saheli store on Amazon.in platform and this will help in getting more visibility among customers. And finally, Amazon will also provide marketing support to grow the brand of the newcomer. So these are some of the benefits associated with joining this Amazon Saheli in which state government of Andhra Pradesh is already collaborating. With this, we come to the end of analysis of this news article. Now let's move on to next article. These editorials are with reference to the new national education policy 2020. In our yesterday's analysis, we discussed the major highlights or the salient features of the new national education policy. Today, we shall see expert opinions with reference to some of the features in this policy. See, one of the editorials is authored by the director of IIT Madras. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of these articles is highlighted here for your reference. See, the new national education policy proposes an overarching and transforming reforms in education sector and this is to replace the last national policy that is the national policy of education 1986. If we come to few important proposals of NEP in structural terms, one is to introduce early childhood education from age 3, then to provide board examinations twice in a year to help improve performance. And of course, this will also reduce the pressure that usually accumulates in the end of the academic year. And there is also provision for making internal assessments more robust than before. Then moving away from rote learning, so as to improve mathematical skills for everyone. Then it also provides for a four-year undergraduate degree system as well. And another important provision is to create 
a single regulator called as Higher Education Commission of India, which will have separate verticals for different functions. As per the 2020 policy, school education starts at age 3 with preschooling or Anganwadi. So the policy recognizes the primacy of formative years from ages 3 to 8 in shaping this child's future and it also recognizes that ages 3 to 6 is crucial for the development of mental faculties in children. Now the policy also recognizes the importance of learning in child's mother tongue till at least class 5. This can also be understood as teaching can now be bilingual so as to facilitate the child to better understand in her or his comfortable language. Three options have been given. It could be mother tongue or local language or regional language. An author notes that, unfortunately, this proposal of learning in child's mother tongue is against the strong desire of parents today. This is because the new millennium parents are reportedly exposing their children to English language from day one. But here author notes that between the ages 3 to 8, we have to blend the mother tongue and also English in the first five years of school. Because of three language formula, when a child comes out of school, she or he will be well versed in at least three languages, two of which will be Indian languages. Know that at the level of school, even more than three languages can be learnt by a student. Minimum is three. As a result of this focus on multilingual approach to education, multilingual felicity or expertise could become the unique selling proposition of an educated Indian in the times to come. In one of the editorials, the author feels that in a large and diverse country where there is high mobility or high movement, the student should have the option to study the language that enables a transfer within the nation. English performed this rule because of historical factors. Here when we say historical factors, we are relating to British rule. Now as we know here the choice of three languages will be that of states, regions and also of course of students and no language is to be imposed on any student. However, in the existing scenario, it depends and it will take time how the schools are going to cater to the language requirements of students. Some students may prefer different languages which may or may not be catered by the schools. Another important welcoming element in this policy is provisioning of an energy filled breakfast in addition to nutritious midday meal. This will help children to arrive school on time and with totality of time principle they will be able to achieve better learning outcomes. This will be particularly true for those children from disadvantaged households. And with reference to making education equitable and also inclusive, there is a provision for gender inclusion fund and the policy is to recognize and support accordingly the socially and economically disadvantaged children and also for disabled or differently abled children. And as we know, the new policy aims to break the strict separation or division of arts, commerce and science streams in high school. And it also introduces vocational courses with internship right from grade 6. Here, author notes that this might not be received well from the side of parents as they wish to stream their children into professions at the earliest and not to occasional streams or internships during schools. This is a problem with the mindset and a behavioral change and change in mindset in this regard is required. This has to be understood as the children will have hands-on experience and experimental learning with whatever they learn in school which will help them understand better and will also create curiosity. So we should also parallelly overcome the attachment of low esteem to certain vocations in our society, particularly from the side of parents. And as we saw yesterday, this policy proposes a multidisciplinary higher education framework with portable credits, with multiple entry and exits, with certificates, diploma and degrees. This gives more flexibility, this removes the tagging of dropouts, this facilitates students who had challenges to come back to colleges after a break in education. And with respect to higher education, the policy envisages cross enrollment ratio of 50% by the year 2035, which will need certainly crores of new seats and also private participation. Now coming to regulations of institutions, the policy sets in a single body with four verticals for standard setting, funding, accreditation and regulation. The oversight is to be light but tight. For regulation purposes, there will be a separate vertical called as National Higher Education Regulatory Council. And this council is to act as an apex control organization 
and this idea of a single regulatory framework for entire India is bound to be resented from the side of states. Similarly, a national body for aptitude tests that also have to convince the states about the need for such a body at the national level and the merits of the body. This is because education including technical education, medical education and universities subject to few entries in list 1 that is in union list. This comes under concurrent list therefore center definitely need to bring states into confidence in moving big policy changes. On one hand we are also seeing states are complaining that there was not enough discussion in bringing up this policy at the level of parliament. Since it comes under concurrent list definitely both the houses should have discussed this particularly at the level of council of states which is Rajya Sabha. Also note that in news column in today's newspaper there is a news which states that national education policy is still not available in public domain. This is because the Ministry of Education is still waiting for a written approval for the policy to come from the Cabinet Secretariat after the approval made by Union Cabinet recently. So when we get that policy document we can discuss with much clarity. One of the editorials note that among many imperatives the deadline to achieve universal literacy and numeracy by the year 2025 should be a top priority. This is because universal literacy and numeracy crucially determines progress at higher levels. We know that the policy prescribes a target to attain universal foundational literacy and numeracy in all primary schools for all learners by grade 3 and this is to be achieved by the year 2025. Whatever having said in the policy, end of the day it depends on how much public spending is to be made for the entire processes as required. The policy sets a target of public spending by both centre and states together at 6% of GDP. The number at present stands at around 4.4%. However, given the present scenario, present amount of tax collections and tax to GDP ratio and claims on national exchequer from the side of healthcare, from the side of national security. So achieving 6% of GDP for education might be a little bit tough. So this has to be handled appropriately in mobilizing funds and resources. Editorial notes that resources are actually never the main roadblock to success in education. When there is public and political will, resources will find their way from both public and private sources. So now that the wish list is available in the policy, public and political will is necessary to proceed forward to make use of the ingredients and the right recipe from the NEP 2020. What we make of these ingredients depends entirely on public and political leadership. So these are some of the important opinions given by the authors with reference to some features of NEP 2020. With this we come to the end of analysis of this discussion. Now let us move on to the analysis of next news article. This news article is with reference to a report titled as Eradicating Modern Slavery, an Assessment of Commonwealth Government Progress on Achieving SDG Target 8.7. This report was released by Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative along with or in partnership with anti-slavery organization called as Walk Free. See, Walk Free is an initiative of Minderg Foundation. It is an international human rights organization that works to end modern slavery in the world. Now, the report was released on the occasion of World Day Against Trafficking in Persons, which is an initiative of United Nations and it is remembered or carried out on June 30th. Now, coming to United Nations SDG target 8.7, See, it is a target under the SDG goal, decent work and economic growth. Target 8.7 seeks to eradicate forced labor, to end modern slavery and to end human trafficking and to secure prohibition and elimination of worst forms of child labor in all its forms by the year 2025. Now when we say modern slavery, it refers to situations of exploitation wherein a person could not refuse or leave because of threats, violence, coercion, deception or abuse of power. Now let's come to brief points mentioned in the report. It states that one in every 150 persons in the commonwealth is living in modern slavery. And of around 4 crore victims of modern slavery in the world, 40% of them, they live in commonwealth countries. One of the most important thing is that most governments in the commonwealth do not have reliable and consistent data on prevalence of different forms of slavery. And COVID-19 has further increased vulnerability to modern slavery all around the world. 
and one another thing is that no country in the commonwealth has yet enacted legislation for businesses or governments to carry out due diligence to assess modern slavery risks in their supply chains now with reference to india the report states that caste based discrimination is one of the biggest problems because if you take among those persons who are victims of bonded labor many are individuals from scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and know that india accounts for more than half the population of the entire commonwealth still it had not yet developed an action plan to address modern slavery and also there is no national coordinating body or national action plan in place to combat modern slavery therefore the report states that india has the weakest response on this matter and also the government efforts to address bonded labor remain insufficient these are some of the important findings with reference to india now let's move on to next article This advertisement of state government of Punjab pays tributes to Sri Uddham Singh, a legendary revolutionary who laid down his life to avenge the Jallian Wala Bagh massacre. Know that on this day, that is on 31st July in the year 1940, Uddham Singh was hanged in London. He was charged with murder of Michael O'Dwyer, the former Lieutenant Governor of Punjab. who reportedly played a very important role in approving the action of the brigadier general reginald dyer to fire at innocent people men women and children who gathered at jallian wala bagh on 13th april 1919 in this regard we would like to inform that in our april 2020 prelim series we have discussed in length about jallian wala bagh massacre the role played by reginald dyer michael o dyer and also uddham singh in the eighth question in that particular video now let's move on to next part of the discussion we have come to the practice questions discussion session see this question recently union cabinet has approved the national education policy 2020 agricultural education and research is listed under which of the following with reference to seven schedule of the constitution over the last two days you might have seen in newspaper that education comes under concurrent list but you should note that with reference to seven schedule there are some distinctions which means certain areas related to education comes under union list some coming under state list and education including technical education medical education and universities subject to four entries of union list they come under concurrent list here the question asks agricultural education and research this comes under state list so the correct answer is option b This question is with reference to Saheli program. The Saheli program often seen in news refers to a Google led initiative to provide digital connectivity in rural India. See this option corresponds to Internet Sadhi program which is a digital literacy initiative of Google and Tata Trust. The program has contributed towards bridging the digital gender divide in rural India. an initiative of amazon to promote locally made products from women entrepreneurs in india this statement is correct saheli means female friend so connected with women entrepreneurs now option d here an initiative of facebook to provide digital literacy training to women in uttar pradesh this corresponds to we think digital program which was a program in uttar pradesh wherein facebook national commission for women and cyber peace foundation collaborated correct answer option b In this question they have given straits on one side and water bodies involved on the other they are asking which of the above are correctly matched if you observe the three straits and the right hand side in the last one they are saying gulf of oman persian gulf see generally we know that gulf of oman and persian gulf is connected by strait of hormu not lombok so by understanding that third is incorrectly matched you can eliminate options b and c now anyway first pair is correctly matched because both are given as correct in options a and d we have to find out whether second one is correctly matched or not see sunda strait is between the islands of java and sumatra it links java sea with indian ocean so second one is correct therefore the correct answer is option d now this question is with reference to gandhi king scholarly exchange initiative recently seen in news three statements are given which of the statements are correct it is an initiative of india and united kingdom to establish bilateral partnership for collaboration to advance development and shared values the statement is incorrect because of united kingdom it is a proposed initiative between india and the united states of america once first statement is incorrect you can eliminate options a and b now we have to find out whether second statement is correct or not anyway third statement is correct as we can observe in the options 
it focuses on issues like civil rights democracy refugee crisis among others the statement is correct you can easily relate to the name of the initiative which is concerning mahatma gandhi and martin luther king jr so the correct answer for this question is option c 2 and 3 only we have come to the last part that is the question for the last day of mainstreaming scholarship test 2020 here is the fifth and last question for the scholarship test read the question carefully and answer accordingly today's question is a 15 mark question you have to write the answer within the word limit of 250 words and a maximum on 3 pages the question reads what are zoonotic diseases explain the causes of the recent increase in zoonotic diseases how do restrictions on wildlife trade help in containing the spread of these diseases You can take a print out of the main answer sheet for which the link is available in description and comment section. If you do not have access to the printer, you have to draw margins on an A4 sheet. Access this link which is available in description and comment section on how to draw margins. So we hope all of you are aware about how to upload your answers in the portal. You can access the link for answer upload portal or the answer upload portal link, which is available in the description section as well as in the comment section. The link will be disabled tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. So make sure to upload your answer before the upload portal is closed. Once the portal is closed, no answer will be accepted through the email. Answers posted in the comment section and sent through email will not be evaluated. Please note that the reference material for yesterday's question has been given in the description and also in the comment section. Very important before uploading the file name should be renamed to your unique ID. And another important thing note that the link for today's portal is different from that of yesterday's portal. We wish you all the best for this day 5. With this we come to the end of today's the Hindu news analysis if you like the video click the like button comment share it among your friends and those who are in need of such resources and subscribe to Shankar Ayes Academy YouTube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation <music>